Good morning, good morning. Thank you so much for joining me. This is the podcast, The Endurance of Labor Laws. I'm your lovely host, Leslie Sullivan, and today is episode 206, and we are going to take a look at the Judiciary Act of 1789, very important uh, in regards to the history of the United States, so very good to take a look at this. But before we dive in, let me give a big shout out to my listeners because as usual, you guys are awesome. So, let me see here, a big shout out to West Virginia, Oregon, British Columbia, Pennsylvania, Texas, Virginia, New York, California, and Oklahoma in terms of countries, the United States, the Russian Federation, Australia, Slovakia, South Africa, and Iran. Good to see all of you. Okay, so we're going to jump right into this puppy here. Um and again, this goes back to pretty much the beginnings and the foundings of the United States. And I think it's very important that we do know about this act because there's so many things that affect our court systems these days, especially depending on who you elect to be the president because they can nominate people um or appoint people um to the Supreme Court. So, we need to make sure that we have the right people in charge of the right leadership roles and within those responsibilities. So, this is why our founding fathers They were very specific in what they did and there was very much a reason for that. And so what we will dive into here is I just want you to take into consideration what our country would be like if we did not have um the the Constitution of the United States, the Bill of Rights, uh these different acts, um one of them being the Judiciary Act of 1789. Like just think about if we didn't have all these things that our founding fathers and the people right after the founding fathers um if they did not do what they did in terms of founding this country trying to make sure it is safe and not have a monarchy not have tyranny not have a super large federal government which what's interesting is that now we do have a very large federal government and that is not what our founding fathers wanted at all because they saw um the not so good side of having a large government because you know you have to remember that the original um colonists um in the United States well, this would be pre America becoming a country um they were predominantly from countries that had a monarchy and so they were very much used to tyranny and suppression and so that's why they wanted small government and they wanted the power to be with the people because even though there were some very tyrannical monarchies at that time The power was always with the people, it's just that the monarchy and the powers that be were always stripping the people of their power. So this is why we have such a wonderful country in the United States. We have a wonderful constitution and we do have good laws here. Sometimes we have too many and sometimes we have too many federal agencies and our federal government has gotten way too big for its britches. So needless to say, this is why we go over some of these things because these things directly impact our labor. Because if you think about how many times have you worked somewhere where you're like, "Wow, I I totally wish I could sue my employer for that." Well, here's the thing. Acts like this that go back to almost the foundings of our country help to protect your rights. And part of your rights is not only as a citizen, but your workers' rights. And so our founding fathers and the people after them wanted to make sure that we had a good court system. and that you know decisions are not made just by one person which would be a, a monarchy and a dictatorship so you know they want to make sure that we had as much freedom as possible without it being unlawful does that make sense because it's one thing to have freedom it's another thing to take freedom to the extreme and hurt and harm people like you know you have to protect your freedoms because it is your freedoms from god that give you sustainability within your life and also protect you. So this is why our founding fathers they founded the United States, you know, with the mindset and and with the words one nation under God. Because they want to make sure that it wasn't just one person under God, it's one nation under under God. And the reason why they said it like that was because they did not want a queen or a king. Because under a king or a queen the the common way of thinking about kings and queens back then was that they are appointed by God to rule everybody and everybody is subservient to that one person and that's a lie straight out of the depths of hell like the bible doesn't talk about kingships like that are there king and queens going back to biblical times yes but 
you know, the more modern day monarchies took it to the extreme and were really horrible to their people sometimes. You know, what's interesting is that the king and queens, especially the kings in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, whenever they were mean to their people and suppressed them and were horrible to their citizens that they are supposed to protect and govern, they were almost always punished by God because he would not protect a kingdom where a king was being horrible. So I think that you know says a lot when our founding fathers said one nation under God, meaning we are all held accountable by God for what we do. Not just the leaders that we elect, but each and every single one of us as citizens are held accountable. So that's one thing to think about there. But again, um we're looking at the Judiciary Act of 1789. Um the long title is An Act to Establish the Judicial Courts of the United States. Um it says here it was enacted by the first United States Congress and let's see here it was introduced in the Senate as the Judiciary Act by Richard Henry Lee and he introduced that on June 12th 1789 it passed the Senate July 17th 1789 and then it went back and forth back and forth between the House and the Senate because they had a few disagreements on some amendments and acts in there And so they wanted to work out the kinks and things of that nature because you have to remember that around this time we had not been a country very long. So it's good to have um cordial discourse and discuss things in a kind <laughs> sometimes lively manner and to help your country. Like right now, I'm not really sure of any good things that are going on um in terms of our government where they're actually talking to each other. you know one side of the aisle to the other and then actually helping the country it seems like to me the republicans are doing everything they can to try and preserve this country try and protect the constitution of the united states because that protects the citizens and the democrats it's like they just want to tear up that document and have their own little government well that's a fascist so there's a reason why i would say modern day democrats and republicans are not always getting along it's because the democrats It's like they don't want to acknowledge the history of the United States. It's so bizarre. And what's really interesting with that is that it is the it is the uh, Democratic Party that very much is in favor of critical race theory. And critical race theory is very horrible uh to white people uh in the United States and it's very racist. This critical race theory, it's very racist and it's horrible pretty much towards anyone that has fair skin. and is of a european descent. Well, that's racism. So, what's interesting is that the Democratic Party and a lot of the Democratic Party is white. So, you would think they would not be for something that targets their own people. <laughs> like it just doesn't make any sense. It's stupidity. Like racism is racism. It doesn't matter what the color of your skin is. You know, hatred and discrimination based on someone's race or ethnic background is completely immoral, illegal and illogical. It's just wrong. So, my personal opinion on that, but I think a lot of people can definitely agree with it. But anyway, it says the Judiciary Act of 1789 was a United States federal statute enacted on September 24th, 1789 during the first session of the uh, first United States Congress. It established the Federal Judiciary of the United States. It says here Article 3, Section 1 of the Constitution prescribed that the judicial power of the United States shall be vested in one supreme court and such inferior courts as Congress saw fit to establish. It made no provision for the composition or procedures of any of the courts, leaving this to Congress to decide. The existence of a separate federal judiciary had been controversial during the debates over the ratification of the constitution anti-federalists had denounced the judicial power as a potential instrument of national tyranny wow how how right they are on a little bit of that right it says here um the 10 amendments that eventually became the bill of rights um let's see here five dealt primarily with judicial proceedings let's see here even after ratification some opponents of a strong judiciary urged that the federal court system be limited to a supreme court and perhaps local judges congress however decided to establish a system of federal trial courts with broader jurisdiction thereby creating an arm for enforcement of national laws within each state 
I, I can see why they did that. Um, Because I bet they were trying to make sure they didn't have little militias pop up and they didn't have little dictatorships pop up um, in their new founded country. I can see it from both sides on this because I understand how they're looking at it. Um, it says here, uh, U.S. President George Washington signed the act into law on September 24th, 1789. They have had some amendments to it, uh, major amendments. Um, the Judiciary Act of 1801, 1802. 1866, 1867, 1869, 1891, then 1925. And then it says United States Constitutional Amendment um, number 11. Um, I don't know anything about that. I will take a look at that. But that is news to me on those. But I find it very interesting that they have major amendments like one right after the other but within a very specific time frame. So you have two amendments that take place pretty quick in 1801 then 1802. Then you have three that happened really quick in the 1860s, which is right after um, the Civil War, 1866, 1867, 1869, and then it takes a break in terms of making amendments to this, and they have one in 1891, then 1925. So that's very interesting there on that. I'll need to look those up because, you, know, you know, whenever you're founding a new country, things are going to change over time. And the longer you are a country or a nation, the more you're going to see your country, at least I would hope you'd want to see it progress and move forward and do great and wonderful things. And sometimes the only way to do great and wonderful things is to be willing to embrace change. That doesn't mean rip up your constitution. That doesn't mean destroy your liberties or your rights or target people. It means that as your nation grows, Your rules, laws, and regulations should grow, but, but not in terms of suppressing the people. It's just that things change over time. Like, for example, workers' rights have changed over the time tremendously, like within the last hundred years. So, you know, there are a lot of things that have changed. And so I think it's very interesting that, you know, there are some people that are very much against change. And I think they're very, you know, very hypocritical. I was going to say they're hypocrites, but I'm trying to be nice. You know, I think when people are... getting their back up against the wall and, you know, getting angry about change. I'm like, really? Like, well, do you ever like to buy something new at the store? Like if ever you go, you know, to like, you know, a department store like Macy's or something and you buy a new pair of shoes, aren't you making a change? Aren't you changing out one pair of shoes for another? Yes. You know, do you ever want to get a new cell phone? Yes. And do you ever have to learn um, The, basically the new operating system for your new cell phone. Yeah, so people actually are for, excuse me, they actually are for change. Let me go drink a water. Hold on just a second. People actually are for change. It's just that if they don't agree with it or if it's not their idea or if they're just being like, well, I'm not going to do that, then they claim that they don't like change and that, and that there's a problem with change. It's like actually we change all the time. Like not a single one of us is the same person that we were last year. More than likely, people have changed jobs. They've moved. I mean, you're wearing different clothes. You might have a different vehicle. I mean, just, you know, you might be trying a new type of food. Well, that is change. So needless to say, regardless of what country you live in, your country is going to change whether you like it or not. So I think people should embrace the, the journey And work towards something that's very successful for you and your neighbor. Because what I don't like is when people want to make way too many changes all at once. And they want to change the very fabric of everybody's lives. And that's not right to do that. Because that's not change. That's tyranny. And that is suppression and oppression from your government. Like if they're trying to change every little thing about your constitutional rights, you should not embrace that kind of change. You know, it's one thing to invent something. And now there's a patent on the invention that you have. And, you know, let's say, for example, the invention is like the, the cotton mill or something, or the cotton jam, whatever it's called, whatever it's called that helped um, process cotton. Well, here's the thing. Before there was that invention, it was very difficult to process cotton by hand. And this is done predominantly in the South and then Texas and Oklahoma. So whenever that invention came out that helped to process cotton, first of all, there was a patent for it. And number two, Later on down the road, you know, there were rules, laws, and I'd say permits and legislations regarding, you know, the, the cotton industry. Like, did you know that, you know, at least here in Oklahoma, I looked this up one time, 
And I didn't know this, but it's actually illegal for you to plant cotton in your on your property unless you have a permit to do so or you have some kind of license. And the reason why is because of the boll weevil and also infestation from other insects because you know you know regardless of what you're growing it brings pests because pests love food right well if you're not careful about how you're growing cotton and how you are producing it and processing it you could actually cause a huge problem in the ecology of nature in terms of just growing cotton so here's the thing like back in the day you know we didn't have all these rules laws and regulations about produce about cotton about wheat and flour and all this stuff but here's the thing as things change and as people learn about what they're doing you know your rules laws and regulations change over time based on what your country actually needs now that's a two edged sword and here's why sometimes you get crazy liberal nutbags in charge of stuff and they just take these rules laws and regulations to the extreme you know via the strong arm of the federal government and EPA and some of these other action groups that are very um i guess federally i don't want to say mandated but they're just overly connected to labor unions and the democratic party and they very much want to control people's lives well that's not actually helping citizens like it's one thing to pass a law saying hey if you grow this type of crop you have to have a license to do so and you have to show that you know how to produce it so that it doesn't cause a problem. That's different than hey, um we don't want you growing anything and if you try and grow anything, we're going to tax you and throw you in jail. Like like there's two different ways to view this. One actually helps citizens have a business and have a successful form of business. The other type, the latter that I just mentioned, it's the government punishing citizens for trying to be successful and trying to you know earn a living to support themselves and their and to support themselves and their families. So it's it's interesting how people look at these things. And so, you know, whenever you're passing a law or a regulation, you need to look at okay, first of all, why was this thought of? What are they trying to address? And how is this going to affect the citizens of the United States in the short term and the long term? Because you need to look at both of those. to really understand the implications and impl- I can't even say how things are going to affect your people excuse me my mouth is dry let me get another drink of water you have to look at things in such a way that it's like okay how is this going to affect our country in the long term and short term and what are the consequences to these laws whether good bad or ugly like what are the consequences so we want to make sure that everything is on the up and up and it's not a source of punishment but actually a source of success in protecting your citizens. So, just want to mention that. So again, uh, President George Washington signed the act into law on September 24th, 1789. A little bit about the provisions of the act itself. It says the act set the number of Supreme Court justices at 6, one chief justice and five associate uh, justices. Um the Supreme Court was given exclusive original jurisdiction over all civil actions between states. or between the state and the United States as well as overall suits and proceedings brought against ambassadors and other diplomatic personnel and original but not exclusive jurisdiction over all other cases in which a state was a party in any cases brought by an ambassador the court was given appeal of jurisdiction over decisions of the federal circuit courts as well as decisions by state courts holding a uh, invalid any statute or treaty of the United States or holding valid any state law or practice that was challenged as being inconsistent with the federal constitution treaties or laws or rejecting any claim made by a party under a provision of the federal uh, constitution treaties or laws so very interesting there um in regards to the jurisdiction and how important it is about our supreme court justices and things of that nature and we want to make sure that they actually care about the United States and the way that you find out whether or not they care about the United States is you look at how they made decisions when they were like a, a lower court judge and also what kind of articles did they write going all the way back to when they were in college like their essays and how did they view the United States and things of that nature you know one example is a um, One of our Supreme Court justices, I think her name is Soto uh, Sotomayor, if I'm pronouncing her name correctly. 
There's some decisions I agree with, you know, that I think she made a good decision, but some of her writings from when she was younger are absolutely racist. uh towards the citizens of the United States like she's very against white people and it's like wow or any one of european descent well she's allowing her nationality well it's not her nationality her ethnicity because her nationality is american but she's allowing her personal ethnicity to have a direct conflict with her judicial decisions and things should not be based on race like here's the thing like judges are supposed to be impartial like they're not supposed to show favoritism in any way shape or form. You know, otherwise you, you don't have a really good judge there. You know, like for example, whenever you see um th- there's a statue of, you know, Lady Justice, I can't remember what they call her, but you know, she's the one that holds um the scales and she has a blindfold over her eyes. Well, justice is supposed to be blind. And what that means is that you don't want judges that can be bought or sold or that have I would say alliances or show favoritism towards one group over the other and that have you know impartiality basically and they show equality in their decision making. You know Sota Mayor eh, you know she's not the worst but she's not the best. Um it kind of concerned me a little bit but what can you do? So it's just one of those things. You know you have to be careful who you nominate or who you elect as your president because it's your president. that picks these people. And what's interesting what I find is that it tells you a lot about the president that you elect when they pick somebody for these roles that you're just like why in the world that they pick them, you know, what just like I don't get that. I just don't like I'm not a big fan of uh, Sotomayor. I'm also not a fan of um what's that Supreme Court justice's name? Amy something. Let me look it up. Hold on just a second. the one that's catholic um supreme court justices i forget their names what is her name no what is her name sonia elnor where are they it's the one that's catholic and she's like i mean i'm i'm all for people being pro life um yeah amy county barrett i forgot her name and she is way too young to be a supreme court justice i mean that's that's just way too young but anyway um I'm not a big fan of her and I'm really surprised that Donald Trump um nominated her because she she allows her personal faith to interfere with her decisions. And what I mean by that is that she she makes decisions based on Catholicism, not on Christianity. Um you know, Catholicism is not the original faith. Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior is the original faith. Um so I just don't think it's good to have Catholics on um the the Supreme Court. I just don't think that's a good thing to do. I also don't think it's a good thing to elect uh, Catholics to any um any seat for example like a Senate, Congress or whatever the case may be because they they tend to think very Catholic. And I understand that's your faith and I used to be Catholic and I know from being Catholic like what this was like and I just thought sometimes these Catholics are crazy and sometimes they're very hypocritical like they claim to be Christian but yet they're pro abortion. You know, you know, Justice Amy, she's not for abortion but she's um I just think a lot of her decisions are flawed and I think it comes from her religion and I think that's a big problem because Catholicism is a cult. I know from being Catholic it's a cult and I don't think we should have people that are involved in cults be justices on our Supreme Court. Another justice I'm not a fan of is Justice John Roberts. Um he's the chief justice and he really disappointed me um with the Obamacare Act and he some of his decisions are just awful like he's not a, a true Republican and I don't think he's a very good judge because you know I just always wondered based on some of his lousy decisions if maybe the democrats have some dirt on him and they're just twisting his arm see here's the thing this is this is one of the reasons why we have multiple justices so that way if we have a few bad eggs it's not going to extremely um impact the united states at least not for the long term so this is why it's good to not have power all in one seat 
You want to make sure that it's divided out to kind of thing. You almost like our electoral college. There's a reason why we have that. It's because, you know, states like California and New York, um they would always decide who is our next president based on population density and that's not right. So, you know, that creates an equality for states that are not as heavily populated. And what's interesting is our founding fathers knew that. Isn't that interesting? They knew this stuff way back then, so they were not idiots and they were not morons, not by any means. So just FYI, be aware of that. Um, but anyway, it says here the act also created 13 judicial uh, districts within the 11 states that have been ratified. Um, the Constitution. Let's see here. North Carolina and Rhode Island were added as judicial districts in 1790, and other states as they were admitted to the union. Each state um, comprised one district, except for Virginia and Massachusetts. Talks a little bit about them. Let's see here. Congress authorized all people to either represent themselves or to be represented by another person. The act did not permit, uh, prohibit paying a representative to appear in court. Thank goodness, right? Otherwise, you wouldn't have an attorney. Uh, Congress authorized persons who were sued by citizens of another state in the courts of the plaintiff's home state to remove the lawsuit to the federal circuit court. The power of removal and the Supreme Court's power to review um, state court decisions where federal law was at issue established that the federal judicial power would be superior to that of the states. The act created the office of attorney general whose primary responsibility was to represent the United States before the Supreme Court and sometimes the United States is wrong and it's usually the federal government. <laughs> so no surprise there. So it's like the larger your federal government gets, the more mistakes it makes because it tries to take over people's lives. And um, the act also created a United States attorney and a United States marshal for each judicial district. Uh, the Judiciary Act of 1789 included the Alien Tort Statute. I'm not familiar with that, which provides jurisdiction in the district courts over lawsuits by aliens or, or sorry, uh, by aliens for torts in violation of the law of nations or treaties of the United States. I'm not aware of that, but we'll double check. Immediately after signing the Judiciary Act into law, President Washington submitted his nominations to fill the offices created by the act. All six of Washington's Supreme Court uh, nominees were confirmed by the Senate, except for one who declined, and he was replaced. So it says the first six persons to serve on the United States Supreme Court were John Jay, uh, John Rutledge, William Cushing, James Wilson, uh, John Blair, and then James Iredell. I think that's what it says. Very interesting there. So. What it makes me want to look up, it makes me want to look up the court cases that they had um, around the beginnings of uh, the United States and how they handled stuff back then. Because um, there was a lot to do with property rights, I can't even say it, property rights, excuse me, back then. Because, you know, when you are a new country, a new nation, you kind of have to have rules, laws, and regulations in place to establish, okay, who's a citizen, who's not, who owns property, and who does not. So here's the thing, if you're a citizen, you can own property. And here's the thing, when you are a citizen, that means you have rights to go to court, to take someone to court, but also you can be taken to court. So they wanted to make sure that everybody had equality, especially within the court system, because over in England and these monarchies, I mean, if you were a peasant, you had no say. You you were just out of luck. You didn't have representation. You're treated like garbage. I mean, you were a subservient second or third class citizen in the United States. No one was a second or third class citizen. Everybody was equal. If you were a citizen, there was equality. That's just how it was and that's how it is. And what I find very interesting is that there's so many ignorant people, especially um people in college these days. Um, they think that you know when the United States was founded, it was founded um, via colonialism, and that it was very um, racist, and that it was um, how to describe this. It was basically trying to limit people's um, freedoms and suppressing people, and making trying to make sure that people don't have rights. Well, that is just the opposite of what happened. So I really wish more people would read the history of the United States. Not what they think it is, but what it actually is. And so here's the thing: what a lot of people don't know, or they're not being taught, especially our, our younger people, is that they're not being taught that the original citizens of the United States 
they actually had to forfeit their citizenship from any other country that they were a part of, which was uh, which was predominantly the United Kingdom. So, you know, there were many people that immigrated over here that were known as, I guess, knights or ladies or they were known as being part of the gentry and you know, they gave up, you know, being a bureaucrat or an aristocrat. They they gave all that up to be in the United States and to be just a regular average uh, average everyday citizen. So, here's the thing, like we did not have the gentry here from the moment the United States was created. The gentry was here prior to that because Britain was the one that established the original 13 colonies. But the colonists that were here were not seen as equals to the citizens back in um, Great Britain. See that that's the that's how monarchies are. They pick favorites within certain types of citizenship. So under a monarchy, you have different forms of citizenship based on whether or not your king or queen likes you, or whether or not they want to get rid of you. Just look at what King Henry the Eighth did. How many people? um he had murdered and killed including some of the women he was married to like he beheaded or he had a um, the Anne of Berlin she was his wife she was queen of England he had her beheaded i mean just think about that so you know here's the thing um the people that lived here in the 13 colonies were very much aware of how horrible and awful a monarchy is because they had seen king after king queen after queen that had been really horrible to citizens you know or well they weren't even considered citizens they were considered subjects so you're not a citizen when you have a monarchy you're a subject to the crown meaning you're below someone all the time and you don't really get to move up in status unless the king or queen or whoever they put in charge over your your land allows you to move up. Well, here in the United States, the way that our founding fathers created the United States is that no one can stop you from moving up. No one. It's up to you to be just as successful as you want to be. And this comes down to one of these acts and one of them is the Judiciary Act of 1789. And the reason why this one is so important is it gives citizens equal merit within the court of law in any court of law whether it is your state court, your federal court, the appellate court or the supreme court. So, you know, here's the thing. Basically no one that lived here at that time, 1789 and on back when they lived here in in the United States, which again was not, you know, the United States prior to 1776 or whatever. Um no one had those rights. Why? Because they were subject to the monarchy. They were subject to the United Kingdom. So, you know, if the United States is so horrible, how come we have so many freedoms and how come, you know, we actually have the right to defend and to protect ourselves as citizens and as a country? Like it makes a difference. It makes a big difference. You know, one of the ways that bad governments get into power is they fool people into thinking, "Oh, you don't need all these rights. You don't need all these freedoms. You know, it's a lot for you to handle your freedoms, so let us handle it. You know, let the big government handle it." That's why big government is a problem, and that's what Ronald Reagan was talking about, you know, predominantly um throughout his two terms of being president of the United States. He tried everything to try and pull back the reins or pull the reins back on the federal government because it was just so big, fat and bloated like a big old fat tick. And it was causing inflation. It was horrible. So I mean, you know, there's a lot that goes into having rights here in the United States. And just think about like as a worker, you have every right to take your employer to court. It doesn't matter whether or not you sign an arbitration agreement. And here's one thing I can't stand about employers that they're doing. I think this is very evil. Part of the employment application these days, which is very shady, is if you want to work there, you have to sign as part of your employment application as part of your background um background check that they, they sneak in there an arbitration agreement that you are agreeing to not sue them and to go to arbitration first, and that's if it ever gets to court. Here's the thing. 
Even if you sign that, you can still take someone to court. I've noticed that a lot of companies that operate in at-will states, they, they, they pull that. They pull that. I'm not saying it doesn't happen in non-at-will states, but, you know, as you know, I'm from Oklahoma, and, you know, I read what I, what I sign. Like, whenever I'm filling out an employment application, and I take pictures of what I take. I mean, I take pictures of what I sign. And sometimes I ask, hey, can you make a copy of this so I have one for my files? Ooh, they hate that. I'm like, well, if you have a copy of my application, whether it's a PDF or a paper copy, why can't I have a copy? It's my information. I would like to have that for my records. You'd be surprised how many employers, shady employers, not good employers, shady employers, how many shady employers don't want you to know your rights. And that's why I started this podcast. Because I definitely fell victim to not knowing my rights as a citizen of the United States. I did not know my rights as a worker. And I did not know my rights as you know, an Oklahoman. Like wherever you live, based on your state constitution, you have rights. So look at it this way. Whether you, whether you live in Oklahoma, California, New York, Rhode Island, Minnesota, Washington, Florida, wherever, not only do you have rights from the Constitution of the United States, and those are federal rights, meaning they are protected by the federal government and the Constitution, right? You also have rights, you know, wherever you live, based on your state constitution. So you need to read your state constitution. I remember when I read the Constitution of Oklahoma in its entirety in my 20s, and I just happened to come across something that, I'm trying to remember what it was. Oh, I was looking at, a, uh, I was looking at an apartment And of these weird people, they had me go to a corporate office. I'd never seen this happen. So you go look at the property. But then when they actually want you to sign the lease, they have you go to a corporate office. And they had me watch like this one or two hour video that they read the lease to me. And I was like, what in the world? It was crazy. I was like, I don't have time for this. So they were reading the lease to me like through this video. It was so dumb. It took forever. And you know, as they're reading it, I'm actually... I'm actually reading it um, you know, as you go along, like the actual paper form, and I was like, wait a second. Some of this does not sound right because you, know, you, you have the Landlord-Tenant Act here in the state of Oklahoma, and a lot of states have that, but not all of them are written very well. Oklahoma's Landlord-Tenant Act happens to be written really well, in my personal opinion. It could be made better. Um, but anyway, so this stupid video is reading off this entire lease to me, which was like page after page after page. It was horrible. I hate it. And um, I was like, you know, I kind of feel like I need to reread the Landlord-Tenant Act based on what these people are saying because there's something shady in this lease. And then I was like, you know, what? I need to read the Constitution of Oklahoma. Like, what are the state's rights here? And I, I reread the Constitution of the United States, and then I read the Constitution of Oklahoma in its entirety. And I was like, wow, I am not doing business with these people There was something that was so shady about their contract. I was like, you know what? Because they're putting a lot of pressure on you as you're about to sign this lease. It, it just kind of felt like being at a used car dealership. And, and, you know, what's interesting is that I kind of felt like they were making me watch this video to break me down. So that way I would be so mentally exhausted that I wouldn't be paying attention to what I'm signing because it was exhausting. It was mentally and kind of emotionally draining to be listening to all this. And I was just like, you know what? I, I don't think I want the apartment. I'm not going to sign this. And they got angry at me. They were mad. They're like, you know, we spent a lot of time on you. You know, we had you watch our video. I said, yeah, and I didn't enjoy it. Um, I could have easily read this at home. I was like, no landlord or apartment complex has ever had me sit down and watch a two-hour video about their lease. And they get angry at me when I'm like, you know what? I don't think this is for me. So, I mean... It just kind of felt like a shakedown is what it felt like. It felt like how you know that the, um, it's kind of like what the police do when they take you in for questioning. It's like they don't start questioning you sometimes right away. They make you wait and wait. So it builds up nervousness. It, it builds up anxiety in you. So then it, it makes you nervous when talking to the police. And then if, you, then if you slip up in what you say, oh, you're a liar, you're the suspect. And it's like, no, actually, I'm just nervous. You know, it's just like... I've seen this in videos, and it's like, you know what? Don't ever go to a police department and give a statement without an attorney, ever. 
Because they, you know, the, the police, they have tactics, and I don't agree with this. They know how to break people. They treat citizens like they're, I, I, don't, I don't know, like enemies of the state. Like it's one thing to break down a terrorist, you know, to, to break them in interrogation, but to break down citizens in interrogation, I've seen some really weird ones. I'm like, wow, unconstitutional, unethical You know, it just makes you not trust the police because of the stuff that they do. And, you know, I'm from Oklahoma, and we have a very high incarceration rate. And we've actually had some people that have been unlawfully imprisoned. And it's like, you have to be careful. You know, normally, you know, I remember back in the day, I've said this before, I always thought it was odd when someone had their attorney or a attorney in their phone, like on speed dial, just in case something ever happens. I was like, well, what kind of lifestyle are you living that you have to have that? Here's the thing. You can have a perfectly normal lifestyle and be targeted by the police or be in the wrong place at the wrong time or whatever, and it just looks bad for you, but you didn't actually do anything wrong, but yet the police won't believe you, or they choose not to believe you, or they make stuff up, make stuff up about you. Excuse me. Um, let me get you a drink of water. Hold on just a moment. So in those instances, it's very important to have an attorney on your side because attorneys – They are very much aware of the, tax, the tactics excuse me, of the police. So one thing that you know, I've learned from you know, different videos and things like this and you know, some of the scandals that we've had in Oklahoma and other places within the Bible Belt is that you know, sometimes what the police do is they sit you in a room, make you wait hours, hours, and then they make it seem like you, you can't leave the room and you can't leave the police department when you can. If you're not under arrest... You can leave at any time. You don't have to talk to them. You don't have to sit there and take it. You don't have to sit there and take it. You don't have to sit there and talk to them, nothing, or be, be bullied, nothing. I would always say go to an attorney. And I used to never think that way when I was younger. But the more people I meet that have been roughed up by police, you know, it's like, wow. You know, there's a, you know, there's a reason why our founding fathers set up these courts the way they did. Because they wanted to try and cut down on, on corruption as much as possible because there was so much corruption within the monarchy back in the, uh, in the United Kingdom and, and Great Britain or whatever. And plus there was a lot of policing going on here in the original 13 colonies prior to the Revolutionary War. That's one of the reasons that you know, the Revolutionary War was, was started was because Britain um, – put infantry men here, soldiers, in, in the colonies, and they just unlawfully entered people's homes and tried to confiscate their guns, and they were terrorizing the colonists here. So there's, you know, I don't know why, but it seems like whenever people are put in charge of policing, it can go downhill really quick, and they can do things that they are not supposed to do, whether legally or morally. And I say legally or morally because just because something is legal doesn't mean it's moral. So, for example, the British soldiers that were harassing and policing the, the original 13 colonies and the colonists, they may have legally had permission from, from the king or queen or whatever, from the monarchy, but it wasn't moral what they were doing, like it was unchristian, meaning it's hell-like behavior. And yet they knew what they were doing, and they knew it was wrong, but yet they were horrible to, to, to the colonists here in the United States. So needless to say, you know, we as the United States, we have a wonderful country. We do not have a monarchy. But as we've seen in different podcast episodes, there's been some bad people in, um, in positions of power, especially within law enforcement. And then you wonder, okay, how did these bad people get into these positions? They were hired. They were recruited. It's kind of like what I said, like it's like a good old boy club. You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours, bros before hoes. I mean, we just saw in a previous episode, you know, within the Secret Service, that they've gotten in trouble multiple times for having sex with prostitutes and then not wanting to pay them. <laughs> so it's like, wow. <laughs> you know, the Secret Service, they like to get paid, you know, when they do their job, but they don't acknowledge that prostitution is a job. It's an actual uh, occupation. I don't agree with it. I think it's grotesque and sick and weird, but I mean, if you enter into an agreement, you know, those women deserve to be paid for what they did, and I guarantee you they didn't enjoy it. 
I guarantee you they they wish that they were not in that occupation and they wish that they were married, had a wonderful husband and had a wonderful family. And here you have men like the Secret Service and some of these other people that work for the federal government having sex with these women whether in the United States or in Colombia or wherever and not even paying their tab. That's like going to a bar drinking shot after shot or beer after beer and then trying to do, do the walk out and you know basically still liquor. I mean that is I think that just shows you the lack of integrity, really. But needless to say, even what those people did was considered wrong in the eyes of the law, but what's interesting is that they were the law. Isn't that sad like they were the law and they had to be called out on their behavior. And they should have been called out. And you know what's interesting is that you know the reason why we have our court system set up the way that it is is so that we don't have police officers as judges. That's very important. And also that we don't have police officers that are lawyers. Because you know, what do you think they're going to do with anybody and everybody they suspect of something? They're going to do what China and Russia and sometimes what Iran does to people. Lock them up, torture them, you know, verdict, you know, before the trial. Basically, you do not have justice. You don't have justice at all. There there is no right to a fair and speedy trial. See, this is why, you know, we have problems in um I would say with the law enforcement is because they lack good judgment. This is why it's so important to have judges that cannot be bought or sold and that do not always side with the police because the police are often very wrong. Very wrong. You know, I've often wondered, you know, have the police ever considered watching like crime scene shows like CSI or or NCIS or something and maybe they could learn something about how about how to properly solve crimes? I mean, I know those are fictitious shows, but a lot of them use real life um situations and they also have to be trained like those those actors and actresses. They have to be trained on the different types of equipment that are used in labs that are supposed to be used in laboratories when researching a case for the police. I mean, just think about fingerprinting. and you know the the technology with that and then the databases that state governments or our state law enforcement and federal law enforcement use I mean over the years I mean you know I meet some good cops for sure I meet some nice ones but I've also met some really dumb ones I've met some hateful ones I'm like man I wouldn't trust them as far as you could throw a stick there are just some bad cops out there and it's like wow um It's kind of shocking. I mean, but just look at it this way: Aren't you glad that police officers are not judges, and they're not prosecutors? Oh, here, here, oh, here's another thing: Aren't you glad that whenever someone is selecting a jury, not every member of the jury, hardly any of them, are cops? Like, can you imagine if you've been falsely accused of something? No one believes you. I mean, well, your family, of course, would, and like people that are sane and normal believe you. But you know, let's say for example, you have cops that are the prosecutor, you have cops that are um, the judge, and then your jury—they're all made up of police officers. Do you really think you're going to get a fair trial? No, you're not, because what I just mentioned is exactly what happens in communist countries. Exactly. they put the police in charge of justice that's not their job and they're horrible at it they make mistakes all the time so this is why our founding fathers and and those that came after our founding fathers this is why they they have the judiciary act of 1789 and why they set up our court system the way they did they wanted to eliminate as much as possible any type of tyranny or favoritism and they did not want policing at all but they especially did not want policing from the bench that's why they have this act 
because they knew that if you put any type of law enforcement in charge of your judges, your juries and things of that nature, basically everybody's going to end up in jail. And you won't have a fair trial. I mean, you just like everybody, even if someone is guilty of a crime, they have a right to a fair trial because you have rights. And you would think that all judges would know that. But see, here's the thing: not all judges know that because not all attorneys agree with that. And see, here's the thing: every single judge, at one point in time, at least in the United States, was an attorney. I can't think of a single judge that was just made a judge and they didn't go to law school. Usually, you do not become a judge unless you have been to law school and you have been practicing law for a long time. Meaning, you you have some experience under your belt and you have good experience, not lousy experience. Like you don't have corruption charges brought against you or something. Like it's very disappointing. Whenever there is a, a case where a judge has corruption charges brought against them because they've been doing some really bad stuff, but here's the thing, they deserve to be called out on that. And what I always say is like, okay, I bet those corruption charges are nothing new. Like they had a character flaw long before the, the charges were brought against them. That's my personal opinion because th- they probably had been making the same mistake willingly and knowingly for a long time before they actually got caught. We've had some issues like that here in Oklahoma. It's very disappointing, but it's like okay, at least they got caught, so we can get somebody better in office, or we we can have somebody that is um, more Christian, actually believes in the law of the land, and actually believes in in protecting and defending the innocent. I mean, it's just that's just how I view it. But you know, it's acts like this, the Judiciary Act of 1789. that really sets the foundation for having a good court system. Cuz it's easy to have corruption. I mean, all you have to do is take a look at like Jamaica, China, um, wow, any kind of socialist country, they have quite a oh, like Canada. <laughs> they have corruption in their judicial um system in terms of their of their judges. I mean, they they do, but that comes down to Canada stupidly voting socialist and uh, voting for Trudeau. Like they have no one to blame for themselves. I mean they they have no one to blame but themselves, excuse me for that. So it's like okay, you know, you keep crying wolf, but you keep letting the wolf in the pasture where the sheep are. That's why you have those problems, Canada. Stop electing bad people. <laughs> it's just how it is. But I will go ahead and end this podcast. Um but as usual until next time, I pray that you're happy, healthy and whole. That you have a wonderful day and a wonderful week. Thank you so much. God bless and bye-bye.